So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest installment of our Aperio Teaching and Learning meeting. Today is Wednesday, May 2nd. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm with the University of Virginia, and I'll be facilitating our meeting today. Thanks for accommodating us in a slightly different electronic format. Uh, we're hoping to have Louisa Lee on the call with us from China, and it's a little bit easier for Louisa to connect with us if we're using Zoom. So thanks, everybody, for making a one-time or maybe a two-time adjustment with us here uh, so that we can accommodate her uh, when and if she's available. Wilma did say that the link to the Etherpad might not show up for you in the chat if you were not in the room before I posted it. So I'm going to go ahead and post that link in the chat again. And if you don't see the chat, you can access the chat just by hovering over the Zoom window, and then you'll see some icons appear at the bottom there, and one of those is the chat. So I posted that link again for anybody who hasn't already seen it. As usual, we're going to take just a few minutes here uh, to dive in and get some updates from any project leads who happen to be on the call. I know Wilma is here and Wilma has uh, some announcements and some potential feature requests that she wants to discuss with everybody. Before we dive in and do that, any other announcements that people want to discuss or bring up. Of course, we're about one month away from Open Aperio. I know many of you will be planning to be there. At least I hope many of you will be able to be there. I'll look forward to seeing you there. I did make my hotel reservations last night, so I have some place to stay. Now I just have to figure out how I'm supposed to get there. So I'm halfway home. And so I hope people are thinking about that. Josh mentions in the chat that he'd like to say something about the current status of rubrics. Absolutely, Josh. We had some people talking about rubrics at UVA just today. So if you want to give a brief update about that, I think that'd be great. Thanks. Sure. Glad to do that. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, you sound great. Okay. Sounds terrific. Um, so uh, good news about rubrics. So uh, Longsight has been partnering with uh, EDF, uh, Miguel Palacer's uh, firm in Spain to do the development of rubrics over the last few months and uh, it's been we, we're, we're, in, we're in decently good shape at this point so the uh, the rubric service is done the rubrics tool is done as well as integrations with assignments Samago gradebook and forums so we're in the stage now where Earl has a little bit of security work that left to do and uh, we're intending to get all that merged to master 13x master um, by we're hoping the middle part of May I have in my mind Monday the 14th so at that point we can do some intensive QA and some documentation so anyone from this group who would like to help with the QA at that point we would love to have some additional help the more eyes the better so the plan for rubrics is to have it done by open aperio so Earl can announce it during his session on rubrics um, and then it'll be in 13 X uh, so I am open, certainly, and I'd be glad to have the community agitate for having it included in a 12x maintenance release, but there's a, there's a conversation about that. It's uh, adding functionality in a maintenance release is not the way the community has liked to go in the past, I understand. So um, we're going we're gonna to make it available to long-site clients in a special feature branch, but I'd love to have it more broadly available. Um, if folks would like to lead and pursue that conversation, I certainly would have my support. That's awesome. Thanks, Josh. And I see a comment in the chat from Martin that the LAMP group could help with some of that. So Josh that might be something that. that you guys want to talk about <laughs> offline. That's great. I love that. I think that sounds great. Yeah, in fact, just for everybody's information, the, uh, the LAMP group actually helped in a very small way fund that several years ago, I guess, Josh. But... Uh, and actually, you're right. I should mention that uh, Rubrics was largely funded by 191 hours contributed by a bunch of institutions. So uh, when uh, I, I, need to, I need to wrap up the sponsorship list and make that public, so I will do that. Yeah, Martin, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, well, I mean, there were lots of other people, too. And even it got some seed money, I think, from uh, the very first virtual conference in 2015. No, I don't think that went to Rubrics. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. That went to the the conditional release of Sam ago. Never mind. Sorry, Wilma. I was wrong. It's okay. And I see some comments from Dave in the chat uh, that 
we could do a session, probably a very good session for a TNL call about rubric implementation, the things that are going on with rubrics uh, with Sakai generally at specific institutions. And I think that sounds like a great idea. So Josh, I may reach out to you offline about the possibility of uh, putting that together or uh, putting us in touch with somebody who might be able to put that session together for us. Yep, glad to do that. I'm, I'm happy to help organize. Uh, awesome. So I think, you know, Wilma's gonna have a lot to say. Uh, Miguel and Matt Jones will have a lot to say. Awesome, awesome. Well, you guys will be hearing from us, so be on the lookout for that. <laughs> okay, any other basic announcements before we move on to the next couple things in our agenda? Could I respond to something in the chat? Although actually, um, so Dave Johnson writes, why use rubrics? What are they good for? And Wilma, I was wondering if you could give the elevator pitch on, uh, because that seems like a question that we wouldn't want to let pass. Well, I'm not sure that that's a question before we dive into that. Actually, I think that Dave might just be talking about some things that could be part of that presentation. Yeah. And I uh, see that fine, Dave fine point, making a statement point. there. Okay. So I think what Dave was just trying to do was provide some possible outline for how we might want that session to go for these types of meetings. And I think that sounds good. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, Josh, for making sure that we clarified that. Okay, well, before we move on to the next couple of things in our agenda, I wanted to take just a few minutes uh, to talk about Louisa Lee, who is joining us today from China. Thank you so much for joining us, Louisa. Uh, for those of you who don't know Louisa, uh, she has worked with Marist College for a number of years and has done really some amazing work for the Sakai community during her time at Marist. Uh, she was a huge contributor to the Atlas program, uh, a really important program that actually highlights the way that Sakai is being used for innovation in classrooms and in projects all over the world. She was also really heavily involved in a major player in what we call the LEAP project, uh, the Lessons Enhancement Project. And that is just a really essential project that has helped take the lessons tool to an entirely new level and really make it a tool that can be used as a focal point, as a building block for this next generation digital learning environment that everybody is talking so much about. You know, this is really one of the ways that Sakai is poised to be a part of that next generation digital learning environment and it would not be here and it would not be possible uh, if not for Louisa. Uh, Louisa is now uh, back in China, um, but we want her to know that she's always gonna be a part of the community. Uh, I'm gonna post a link uh, to a kudo board here that a number of people from the Sakai community uh, put together for her. And I wanted to post that so that everybody can take a look at that. And if you have not contributed to that yet, and you'd like to contribute to that, uh, please contact me offline. I think there's a way for me or for Tricia to make some adjustments so that you can do that. Uh, so enjoy that, Louisa. Uh, read through all of those. It was really fun for me just to read through them and to see that the way that I felt about you and the way that I felt about all the really important work that you did for the Sakai community uh, was really shared by a lot of people. So thank you so much, Louisa, for everything. And thank you for joining us from China. What time is it there for you right now? Oh, hi. Um, this is uh, 10 p.m. in China. <laughs> <laughs> so you're off the clock right now. So thank you for taking time when you're not supposed to be working to come hang out with us. We really appreciate that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm um, looking for a job, actually. So when you are um, not hired for time, so you work 24-7, kind of. <laughs> I don't know if you guys experience that. You constantly look for new things to do. So 10 p.m. is okay for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I understand that. I think I understand that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm totally not going to turn on my webcam. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay if you're in pajamas for this meeting when it's 10 p.m. That's that's perfectly okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no fuzzy slippers, though, because it's really warm here. It's about uh, 80 degrees. So, oh, yep, yeah, that's too so warm for fuzzy, fuzzy slippers. slippers. Is out. Well, you know, yeah, Laura Seale lives up working. in Chicago. Yeah. 
I, I heard you guys still very cold. Um, um, so I, I'm really touched. I'm looking at the page here. There are so many pictures and videos I did, didn't know you guys even have. <laughs> 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 um, okay. Well, oh I don't think that any God. of these are incriminating or anything, but we did want to share all of that with you to let you know just how much you continue to mean to us. And we hope that we're going to keep you in the community and that we can keep working with you um, for the next several years and beyond. So Louisa, if you want to post your email in the chat or some other contact info in the chat so that people can get in touch with you in case they have leads about jobs or leads about anything or just want to get in touch with you, that would be great also. Yes, fantastic. I just posted my email there. Uh, you can say it's fan.luisalee at outlook.com. Um, I check this regularly, so it should be a good way to contact me. I just cannot get onto Facebook or uh, Twitter or uh, LinkedIn, I think it's fine. Hi, Corey. How are you? <laughs> um, so definitely, definitely welcome to, uh, to contact me. I use a Slack sometimes. Uh, it's just a little bit twitchy. Uh, I can get on sometimes using phone, not Wi-Fi. It's really strange. But I definitely try to check it once in a while, um, at least once a week. So if, if there's anything um slack and uh, uh my email both are fine yeah thank you um i i don't want to take too much of your time for thanking everybody but uh please uh know that i thank everybody thank you i hope to be in the community as long as i can well thank you louisa we're seeing more thanks for you pour in on the group chat here in this meeting which is great <laughs> which is wonderful and just a small portion of what you really deserve for everything that you've brought to the community. So thank you again so much. Thank you, Matt. Of course. Uh, yes. Oh, I mean tears. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that they're good yes, tears. As long as they're yes, good right. tears, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Wilma said that she was going to step away for just a moment and Wilma I'm back. is okay. back now, which is perfect. <laughs> this is great timing because Wilma has some potential feature requests and some other items that she wants to discuss with us briefly before we move into Martin's presentation. So take it away, Wilma, whenever you're ready. Okay, and I'll try to make this quick so I don't hijack too much of the, the lamps time here. Um, but it might be easier if I just show you. So could I use the screen share, Martin? Do you mind if I take that over? Martin? Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, so I had mine on mute. I'm sorry. I was just practicing. Go for it. Take it. Okay, it says I can't start while another participant. Oh, so I'm going to stop here. All right, there we go. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. All right, let me, I made it a few just screen grabs because I thought it'd be easier to, to show you guys as opposed to trying to explain it. So um, let me just show, okay, so this is the current assignment um, list when you go in to, to grade submissions from a student. We had a, a few, um, feature requests from a client and we wanted to get some additional community input on these so that's why I'm, I'm bringing these up um, so anyway this is the current state of the the list of submissions and um, and what we're proposing is to add a link to the profile from here and this is a pretty crude um, demo because I just did this like five minutes before the call, but um, we were thinking to add a thumbnail of the user's profile photo next to the name and that that would link to the user's profile in Sakai. Um, alternately, we could, instead of a picture, um, we could just have the font awesome icon, um, but uh, I thought the pictures were a little more personal. So I was just interested to see what folks think about that. So it looks like we have a question from Dave in the chat um, about whether the link would actually link to the profile or whether it would just be an image pulled from the profile. 
it would link to the profile. So if you click on the image, it would bring up, you know, the, the user's profile that you could view all of their information. Okay, okay. Yeah, I would open in a new window or a modal or something. So we also have a question from Mark about whether the pictures might affect performance. Um, that I can't answer, um, but we'd have to refer that to um, some of our technical folks. Earl was the one that suggested linking to it from here. So he didn't seem to think that there was an issue. Um, at least he didn't express that concern, but we could certainly look into that to see if, if there would be any performance impact. And we also have a question from Dave about whether you think this would open in a new window or tab or in the same window. Wilma, have you thought about that at all? Yeah, I'm thinking it would open in a new tab or a new window of some sort, not take over the current screen um, because you might not want to lose your place in the grading flow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have some comments from Laura about the fact that this would really benefit the instructor only. And in fact, she's not sure exactly how this would benefit the instructor. Do you have any more thoughts, Wilma, about why your client was interested in this feature? Was there something specific that spoke to them about it? Yeah, they wanted to be able to um, give the instructor easy access to view more information about the student when they're going into grade. So they wanted an easier way to get to that profile information. I guess to kind of get to know the students a little bit better and get a sense for who that is as they're grading the, the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also have some comments from Adam. The pictures are more personal, but at least currently in Sakai, there are two types of photos, profile photos and official photos. And like Adam at Providence, UVA also uses the official photos and then people upload personal photos as well in a small number of cases. So would this display the official photo, Wilma, or the custom photo, or have you guys thought about that yet? We haven't really decided that. Um, off the top of my head, I would think that whatever default photo is is displayed like in forums and other places where the photo appears would probably be the same one that would show here um, but you know that would could be another conversation um, not quite sure actually um, as far as FERPA the students wouldn't really see this screen um, I saw a, a question about FERPA in the in the chat um, students wouldn't see this screen so it wouldn't really affect FERPA because only the instructor would have access to this particular view. Um, there are other places in Sakai where students would be able to see other photos if the profiles are available for students to view and that's usually a configuration setting and under privacy that you can set for the institution. So if, if these images surfaced in other places where students would see them, the privacy um, settings would trump whatever display settings are available. We also have some comments here in the chat that this sounds like it could be a UI consistency issue. Um, so maybe we would not want to apply this sort of feature in one particular place within Sakai unless we were prepared to implement it elsewhere in Sakai. Uh, that's something that we probably do want to think about, you know, in conjunction with some of these other UI projects like the project uh, that Jolie Tingen and Sean Foster are working on right now. Right. Yeah, we, um, we were actually playing with the idea of incorporating these types of thumbnails into a redesign of forums. Um, although that's still kind of very much in the brainstorm phase um, in the, the group that's talking about modernizing forums. And currently right now, and let me just switch over to Sakai to show you, this sort of um, feature actually shows up in Commons, which is a current tool. So in here you can see the, the profile thumbnails for, um, for any posts, and that's currently in Sakai 12. So that's kind of a little bit of the inspiration. It's also modeled after a lot of other um, more modern you know, social networking sites or things like Google where you see the thumbnail of the user.
Well, this is great. Thanks for soliciting yeah. some feedback here, Wilma. I'm seeing more uh, comments in the chat. You know, some people, I think, are feeling pretty positive about it, unless there's a performance impact, of course. We do uh, see some comments, like some of the comments that we've noted earlier about the fact that maybe this is adding more noise than sound, you know, if these images are really too small to have much of an effect of an effect, although if it takes you out into the student's profile page, that might be a little bit more of a value add. Uh, Josh is asking if there's a JIRA that people can comment on and place their thoughts and ideas. Wilma, have you guys created yeah, a JIRA Yeah, I don't know this? if Earl created a JIRA for that or not. Um, that was something that was in one of our internal tickets, but I don't know if there was a JIRA created yet. Um, so we were still in the process of estimating the hours required. Yeah, I like the idea of linking to the one place. We, we had a client who also wanted like an integration with external service, like Name Coach, to help pronounce names. Mm -hmm. and, like and like adding that everywhere there's a name, it just sounds like it's a lot of work. It sounds like it's the same amount of work as this thing is. So, yeah. it's, and we don't want to have like a link. Now you can here you can see the picture. Here you can pronounce the name. Here you can, you know, see their email. You know, we don't want to have like a bunch of links every single place they have their name. It, we need to have a consistency. Sounds like a good idea, though. So let me just show you a couple other quick images. Um, this is the current uh, grading screen where you see the student name. And um, the idea was to also add the profile image there or a link to the profile there. Um, so that as you're grading, again, if you're in this detail screen, you would also see it here. Um, and then finally, we had a question about the grade report. This is an existing report, um, and uh, you can filter it by student. So if you're just interested in all the assignments submitted by a particular student, there's already a, a filter in there to do that. And we were wondering if people thought it would be um, helpful to also have a status column in addition to the information that you're already given. This is the information you already have. Um, you get the assignment, grade, scale, um, submitted. So you get to know, you know when they submitted and if it's been graded, basically. Um, but the status column would also give you things like um, ungraded or released or um, returned if you kick it back to the student for another try. So we were wondering if that would be helpful information in this screen. I'm already seeing some comments in the chat that are positive. Uh, Laura Sierra indicating status would be great. Uh, Dave indicating that's valuable feedback to the instructor. Uh, Charles is asking whether the grade release would be a separate column or is that incorporated into that status column, Wilma? It's currently in the status column. It would basically be what's um, currently displayed when you go, let me go into, like if you go here, um, you see the status and it tells you if it's been returned or released or actually I'm sorry you're right it's in a separate column um, yeah I don't know um, we could possibly include the release as another feature in that um, at least in UVA's instance and I assume that this is true for generic Sakai as well when a grade has been graded and released, the status changes from graded to returned. And so I think that there are separate statuses there. And so we might not need to incorporate that release column because at least in UVA's instance of Sakai, that's just a check mark that I think exists to allow instructors to quickly see whether they have released student grades back to the students. Because I think that those two statuses yeah, are separate. Yeah, I think you're right. That's what I was thinking of. So thank you for clarifying that because I couldn't remember what it looked like. <laughs> well, in fact, we had an instructor ask about this this morning. And that's the reason why I can remember because it just happened like an hour ago. If it had happened longer ago, nope, no chance. <laughs> um. Great. So thank you guys for the feedback on that. We'll definitely be opening a couple JIRAs about these. So if you have additional thoughts or comments, you can definitely um, contribute your thoughts there. And then one last thing, and then I promise I am lamp. I will turn it over to you, Martin. Um, we had a, a thing that came up in the core team call um, about, uh, it actually had to do with accessibility. And it's, it's these link 
buttons that appear in multiple um, places on a single screen. And when a screen reader reads through this, it's very repetitive for the end user. So it's an accessibility issue to have it on there so many times. Um, so we were just wondering, does anybody really use these links? Because there was a proposal to just get rid of them if they're not really being used. We're seeing some comments in the chat from Dave. He uses the link to the course, but not to the individual widgets on the page. Uh, Martin comments, he doesn't even know what they do. That seems to me <laughs> to be a good argument for removal. I like that. I know that speaking for UVA, this is actually a button that we have removed from the UI uh, on our pages in most of the systems. So those buttons aren't even present for us. So I think we would certainly add a plus one there. Yeah, I think it would simplify the overall interface to have fewer things on the screen, particularly because there's so many widgets. Um, Matt, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. I think just the question was that we would, uh, if we want to disable this or just remove this entirely, I don't know if how, how useful this was. If we disable it, you know, it's like it's, you want to eventually re remove stuff that's disabled by default if nobody's using it. We see some more comments in the chat from Dave that accessibility here would trump the needfulness of the button, uh, even if people were needing it and using it occasionally. Laura comments she doesn't know that people use them. And Adam is asking a question just for clarification. Uh, we're only referring to the widgets on the overview page and not the direct tool links on other pages. Is that right, Wilma? Uh, it, was, it was this link everywhere. Yeah. It was the link button everywhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. This page is particularly problematic because it shows up so many times, mm -hmm. but it's throughout the interface. So would there be a way, this Dave, um, Evelyn, would there be a way to leave the direct link surfaced to an instructor? So for example, if I'm trying to communicate with a student saying, you need to go here, and rather than telling them to go to the course, go to this area, go to click there and do this, I can simply grab the direct link somewhere that's surfaced. Well, I, to I think you can still do that in the URL. So because okay, it's so, frameless, um, if you grab the URL for most places in Sakai, it's just going to take you to that area of the okay. course anyway. It's okay. just well, not the shortened case, version of the We may just simply have a redundancy, Wilma, that we just simply need to cover that way. That would be okay with me. Yeah. Yeah, it'll give you a, it just gives you a shorter version. You can like right. use the shortener service to get an even shorter version. I think nowadays, before it was a bigger deal because we had the iframes, but technically it's just really just a shorter URL now. So we have a comment from Adam in the chat that he uses that link button when he sends support requests in order to have a hyperlink that goes straight to the tool in question. So as we're discussing here, that may not necessarily be required uh, now that we have this new frameless uh, set up where you can give those URLs uh, that appear there for the tool. But he also points out that the link button does currently have exposure to that URL shortener as Matt and some other folks mentioned and that some people apparently are using that. Yeah, I think, you know, the issue was we could, we could fix it, but that would be some time to make it accessible. Right. And but we Dave, don't, don't want to spend the time to do that if there wasn't much interest in keeping it. Right. Hey, Matthew, uh, this is Dave Evelyn. In the fixing of it, the fixing of it, of course, would take a lot longer to make it accessible than the either disabling or removal of it. Is that right? Do I understand? Yeah, it? for sure. It would have to be rewritten to be a new, like, a new uh, component than what it's using. I don't know an estimate. It wouldn't be, like, incredibly long, but it would be a couple hours. Adam is asking whether this could potentially be globally enabled or disabled by a system property. Matt, do you know about that? It already can. Okay. We were just afraid if we disabled it, like, for default, so it could pass accessibility, then if people turn it on, they would have an accessibility issue and nobody would turn it on. And right. It wouldn't be tested with it on. Yeah. And then we've got code in there that's not really being used. So it's, it adds to the complexity of the 
overall code base. Mm -hmm. And so Dave is commenting in the chat, from a use of resources standpoint, I'd say disable toward removal as this would be a great way to increase the accessible nature of Sakai, especially for screen readers. I think I can speak for Tiffany Stoll, who's one of the leaders of that accessibility group who works here at UVA, that she would definitely agree with that assessment. So I'll put out a plus one on Tiffany's behalf since she's not here with us today. All right, I'm handing over the screen, Martin. You can take it away yeah. now. <laughs> I know we burned through half of the hour, so my apologies. No problem at all. I, <laughs> I was telling Matt, I don't have that much to say. <laughs> so this was, this was a good conversation, though. I appreciate it very much. Um, okay, am I squared away and you can hear me and all that kind of stuff? You are squared away, Martin. We can hear you and see you. It looks beautiful. Okay. So um, what I'd like to talk about is a conference that we run every year. This is actually going to be our 12th year of doing it uh, that we affectionately call LAMP Camp, um, but its official name is the Pedagogy and Technology Conference. And I'm gonna be just up front with you and tell you, I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm hoping that some of you will say, you know what, that'd be some, a good thing for some of my faculty to go to. Um, just to give a little bit of back story to LAMP, so that those of you who don't know, many of you probably do, but just in case you don't, we're, a, we're actually a consortium of, of 19 colleges and universities and other educational organizations, which frankly add to the richness of, of who we are, um, because we have, for example, the uh, National Dance Education Organization, uh, which is an interesting uh, group of people who do dance education across the United States. They're not a college, but they do education. So we're just a, an interesting, eclectic group of people that really like each other. We, the thing that makes us tough or, or complicated is that we share a single instance of Sakai. We do that uh, for cost reasons, but also for mutual support reasons. Um, and so we have this community that's really focused on, and I want to say this quite clearly, pedagogy first and then technology. That's uh, that's sort of always been our mantra. Um, these conferences have been going on for a long time. I just pulled together some of the brochure covers that we've had through the years. Um, it's kind of an interesting mix of, of stuff <laughs> as you go through it. And uh, some people, like Dave Evelyn's probably been to every one of those. And if Terry Golightly were here, she certainly has been to every one. Uh, I think Matthew Jones has been to an awful lot of them. Um, but I've lost track of who's been to how many. But it's, it's our major event that we have every year. Um, and just so you sort of know what it's like, um, as I said earlier, we focus on pedagogy first. Uh, it's, it's really about teaching and learning, and then the technology comes second. We like to, I like to say that the, the technological tail should never wag the pedagogical dog. It's always about teaching and learning, and, and then how we can facilitate that with technology. And when I say technology, I do mean Sakai, but I also mean other technologies that we have as well. We, we've, we've added through the years a number of different technologies. Our typical audience is faculty, probably primarily. Instructional designers, a close second to that. We do attract some administrators because we have administrative topics. And because our, most of our members are small, oftentimes you'll find that IT people are there, but they also serve in the role of faculty or they serve in the role of instructional designer or something like that, but probably their official title is, is IT. Um, we organize the conference into tracks uh, with different What's the plural of focus? Foci? Foci? <laughs> anyway, um, and, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And in the past, we've been able to attract people like Chuck Severance. He's come for a number of years. He's not going to be able to come this year because he's off doing a, a, a Sugi thing. Uh, Neil Caden has, has been there, probably won't be there this year, I'm very sorry to say. Laura Geckler has been. Uh, Scott Sedell has been. Matthew Jones comes a lot. Uh, Jacques Renault has been. I see that Janice Smith is on the call. Janice has been uh, with us before. So we've gotten some really great people uh, to come to the conference, which is a, a really good thing. So this year, um, and, and the theme comes from Wilma. Wilma suggested this theme. We are Sakai, which I think is a, is a neat idea. Um, and just so you know, the dates are July 24th, 25th, and 26th, 2018. We're going to have it in Berea, Kentucky, which happens to be my hometown. I'll talk about that in just a second. The cost for non-LAMP members is $350, and that includes um, all your meals. Uh, meals are an important part. We like to eat, and we do that. Uh, we do that quite well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about where it's going to be held too. I did put the um, URL for the for the conference in the the Etherpad, and let me just copy it and put it in the chat as well, so you'll have that just in case. Um, a lot of what I'm saying here. Uh, 
street lamp always makes you think of Narnia. Very good. <laughs> I have to give, give credit to a guy named Tim Pack for designing that for us. <laughs> He's really good. <laughs> um, and before the conference started, uh, Matt and I were talking, you know, here's Laura Geckler. Um, let's see, there's Neil Caden right there. There's Dave Evelyn. There's Terry Golightly. Uh, you know, there's some people that you know are here. Here's Josh Wilson. There's Matthew Jones. Um, so it's, it's a good bunch of people who, who show up every year, and I really appreciate it, the, the way they come. Let me talk a little bit about the location. We have in the past, um, think that, uh, that's right, Josh, it was your first week. We, we dipped you in the deep end of the pool, didn't we? <laughs> um, in the past, we have tried to have this conference on our member college campuses, and it's just getting more and more difficult. For one thing, we're growing. Um, for another thing, we're attracting people from farther and farther away, so they're not necessarily arriving during work hours, so to speak. Um, it's a little tough when you have somebody who shows up at a, as a residence hall at 1030 at night or, or worse, 1 a.m. because their, their flight was late. Matthew can talk about that. Um, and so we, we just really felt like we needed to sort of switch to a, to a more of a traditional hotel type setting rather than trying to be in residence halls. Um, but we're enough different that I didn't want to do it in just sort of a, a regular hotel. I'm, I'm very fortunate in that the town that I live in, which is the home of Berea College as well, there is this historic hotel. It was actually started in the 30s by the wife of the then president of Berea College who was tired of entertaining guests in her own home. And so it became Boone Tavern and it has grown into this historic hotel, which is quite beautiful and has all these nifty kinds of rooms. There's sort of uh, antique and handmade furniture. And uh, our town is known as the arts and crafts capital of Kentucky. So it, it seemed like it might be a good destination for people to come to. So we're, we're sort of switching gears and we're, we're going to try that this year and see how that works. It's, uh, it's right on I-75, just 40 miles south of Lexington. So it's, it's pretty easy to get to. Um, and so hopefully this is going to work a little better than some of uh, the more remote campuses that we've been to um, in the past, um, even though we've had a lot of fun at some of these, these campuses. Um, <laughs> Josh says he survived. So let me talk about this year, 2018. There's a, there's a person on the call today who's, who's had a few things to say named Wilma Hodges. I don't know if you all know her, uh, but she's going to be our keynote speaker. And I'm really looking forward to that. She, I asked her and she said yes, which I, I appreciate. Um, we always have a track for faculty who are new to Sakai. So one of the things I'd like to say to you all is if you have faculty that you're wanting to sort of get get dipped into Sakai world a little bit, this might be a great place to send them. Um, we, we always have a series for newcomers. Um, Terry Golightly has run that for several years now, and we've sort of adopted a trail metaphor. You're sort of on the trail, you know, and, and you learn how to, how to pack your bags and then make camp and so forth um, as you're getting into Sakai. We try to have a major uh, breakout session for each major tool. Um, so, you know, forums will have a session, uh, assignments will have a session, tests and quizzes will have a session, lessons will have two sessions because it's complicated, and so forth. You sort of get the, the general idea. And uh, it's, it's, it's always sort of a goal so that faculty can begin to build their first course. Uh, we used to say that you would get your course built, but we've, we've learned that faculty need to think a bit about their content. And so um, it, it's, it's a good chance to sort of, you know, think about it in a mutually supportive way. And the people who are, who are leading those sessions are very, very caring and, and helpful to people. Um, thank you, Josh, for that comment. Uh, he said, many conferences feel overwhelming. This one doesn't. Instead, it feels inviting and manageable. And uh, we really, we strive for that. Um, so thanks. That's a, that's a good comment. Um, I'm really pleased to say that we have managed to get David Bauer to come out of the University of Dayton and come down uh, to Kentucky and talk about the uh, attendance tool that the University of Dayton has built. A lot of our schools are using this attendance tool. It's a contrib tool at this point, um, but it, we see it as being an important tool, particularly with some of the federal regs that are coming down. And so the man himself is actually going to come and talk about that. And frankly, I think he is wanting to listen to uh, what do we need to do next to make the, the tool work even better for folks. So I think that's quite a, quite a, quite a kudo to get him to come. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Matthew's going to be there. Um, talking about Sakai 12. He, he's always gracious to come and, and talk about the latest release of Sakai. He also leads uh, what we call the, the uh, IT roundtable, where this, the technology folks get together and, and talk about you know, some of the, the back-end stuff that is very important. Um, you all probably, because of this call, know Terry Golightly fairly well. Um, she's really coming on as being an accessibility guru, 
And so she's going to be leading a session on accessibility, which is very, very important. Uh, you may not know John Paget so well. Uh, he's at Brevard College. Um, he's a Faulkner scholar. Um, but he is really, really good at using plagiarism detection. And, and, and I really like his approach. He really thinks about it as a, what's the pedagogy of plagiarism detection. It's not let's catch kids doing something wrong, but how can we teach them about proper citation and so forth. So he's going to do a session on that. Um, Eric Green from Clear Creek is going to talk about how they built an online tutoring center so that their uh, online students experience the same support that their on-campus students do. There's just all kinds of stuff uh, going on here. So um, let's see, I got to talk, talk and make sure here. Uh, yeah, we, okay, very good. Yep, be worth hearing David Bauer talk about it. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, all right. We're also trying something new this year, and, and I, have to, I have to blame Wilma for this one as well, although uh, blame is the wrong word because I think it's a fabulous idea. She suggested that we, we devote some serious time to a topic around videos, and you can shoot me for the acronym. Um, I kind of like acronyms, so it's going to be a MINGLE, a Massively Interactive Networking Group Learning Experience. How do you like that? Um, the, the fo my thinking is that we'll have one of these every year from now on at, at LAMP Camp, and this year the focus will be on video, next year it'll be on something else. But um, there will be a series of breakout sessions, like um, how to construct a video studio on the cheap last year. Um, John, Dave Evelyn, you can tell me, I've forgotten his last name now. Uh, John, John led a session like that, and he's not a Kentucky Christian anymore. So I'm going to try to uh, take up the slack. I don't think that I'll do as nearly a good job as he will. But uh, he brought in a green screen, and we actually made videos, and we composited stuff, and it was a lot of fun. And I think a lot of people uh, learned some things that they hadn't learned, that they didn't know about before, that you could actually have a video studio that doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, we, we've got folks from Warpire going to come and talk about incorporating video into your courses. Um, the, also, the University of Dayton people have been working with the API for integrating video and lessons so that your, your lessons can actually have a video embedded in it, which then is interactive within the video. That's going to be interesting. Um, Dave Elin going to talk about using video to get course feedback. So there's lots of stuff going on with video. And then we're going to have this big panel discussion about the pedagogical role of video. I think that's going to be really interesting. We're going to have feedback booths so you can practice making a video. Um, and uh, Wilma, I, I think maybe I should stop for a second and you talk just a little bit about what you hope to capture in some of these videos, because it's not just about giving them a chance to practice making videos, but we're going to get something out of it too, right, Wilma? Yeah, um, so part of the, the, the goal is really to get people comfortable with you know, recording and creating videos to make their courses more interactive, but um, sort of a secondary objective is to gather some feedback from people that can be used to promote both Sakai and uh, the LAMP consortium. So um, this is kind of a continuation, <coughs> excuse me, of um, something that we're doing at Open Aperio this year where we're going to have a video booth and people can come and record little um, vignettes and, you know, talk about things and you know tell their story basically um, so that we can then take some of that content and um, you know edit it into um, places where it can be marketed like the website or um, you know different social media channels so the idea is really to get people's stories and get them out there to the wider world so they can see all the great work that you're doing and and realize you know what a vibrant community Sakai really is yeah there you go I mean the picture I have in my mind is sort of antiques roadshow you know where there's always this buzz of activity in the background but you've got somebody talking in the front in the front um, about something really, really interesting, and we'll we'll see whether we can pull that off. But that's our intention: is to do something along those lines. And then on top of that, we want to have this bazaar uh, with these booths around the edge of the room. Dave Evelyn said, sort of a poster session, but um, it, I almost think that a bazaar is a better metaphor. Uh, you know, how do you how do you go about picking a microphone? How much do you have to spend on a decent microphone? Um, you know, can you get by on a, an inexpensive one? What about lighting? You know, what do I really need for lighting? Do I need lighting at all or what do I need? How do I pick a camera? Um, I added this one, Wilma, you and I haven't talked about this, but I, I use a teleprompter sometimes when I make videos and it occurred to me that people may not know much about that. So let's talk about tele teleprompters. Wilma's gonna talk about video editing. You know, how do you go about editing down a video? 
and the warp wire folks are going to talk about how you get it out there. So there's going to be lots going on um, all morning long. So it's going to be pretty exciting. I'm kind of I'm kind of jazzed about it. I think this is going to be um, a lot of fun. Um, next, I'll, I'm I'm going to switch gears here and just show you. This is what the agenda looks like. Oh, I see. I have to erase the annotation. <laughs> how do I do that? Uh, there we go. Oh, I am trainable. Okay. Um, th this is just gives you an idea of what the uh, the agenda for the first day looks like. The, here's the three tracks. The track on the left is typically for the newer faculty. So this is the Tenderfoot Trail, you know, packing for the trip, making camp on the trail. Um, there's using forums. Here's the assignments tool and so forth. Then in the middle, we tend to have things that are more technical. So this is Matthew talking about Sakai 12. Wilma's going to talk about one tool to rule them all. Can uh, can lessons actually uh, become the the tool? Uh, possibly so. There's Matt's uh, technology roundtable. Josh Wilson's going to talk about IT and libraries for Sakaiger. Uh, Wilma's going to. This one's cracks me up. I I can't wait to see this. Can you take Sakai and as an LTI tool incorporate Moodle into Sakai? And Wilma says she thinks you can do it. So she's going to show us how to make a sakoodle. <laughs> you want to say anything about that, Wilma? <laughs> no, no, I pretty much covered it. It's a pretty simple um, concept and principle. So it, it, it's more of a proof of concept. It's not really like, you know, ready for <laughs> prime time, but it's definitely feasible. And I could show you a site that I have set up that way. It's, it's the kind of thing that makes your head just kind of explode. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's day one. Um, here's day two. This is that mingle session all morning long. So we're going to do all the all the stuff, um, and then we have more stuff in the afternoon. Uh, you know, continuing with, you know, here's an accessibility thing for new faculty. Here's tests and quizzes. Here's gradebook. Um, there's the feedback booth. Uh, Rob Keeney, one of our members, is going to talk about LaTeX, uh, which is a that's a popular talk topic. Um, this will only be of interest probably to LAMP. Uh, people, but you know how you connect your administrative systems to Sakai. Uh, we, we, of course, because we're a we're a consortium of 19, um, that becomes a big challenge. You, it's not just one system you're connecting to, but 19 different systems, and so that that gets tough. And um, you know, so so forth and so on. You, these tend to be the more um, administrative, not administrative, but more, more deeply pedagogical track over here on the far side. And then the last day, um, there's Wilma's keynote. Um, there's our two lesson topics uh, on the last day. Here's uh, the attendance, David Bauer from the University of Dayton. Um, this one didn't make, I, I, I wasn't able to get this one arranged, so I'm hoping to find somebody else that can, in fact, some of you all may be able to suggest somebody who could talk about the, the legal requirements for state authorization because the distance ed requirement from the Department of Education is sort of rearing its head again and they're saying July 1 is gonna be the deadline and do they really mean that? And you know, we just sort of need an update from Washington, so to speak. Um, and I was hoping to get this, these folks, but that's, that's fallen through. So I'm going to have to work on that one. So anyway, you get the idea of what the conference is about. Hopefully that gives you a, a thing, uh, sort of a, a, a rough idea. And so just to wrap up, here's, this is our philosophy. And what Josh said earlier, I think really kind of, kind of hit home with me. Uh, you know, we try to be really inviting. We try to be really relaxed. Um, we try to make sure the topics are really interesting, that we've got skilled and challenging presenters. And frankly, we try to design it so that there's plenty of time and space for people to chat. Um, I like to say what happens in the hallways is as important as what happens in the sessions. And that, that really seems to be true, just watching people. We've, we've tweaked the agenda over the years, and we now have half-hour breaks in between sessions and those half hours seem to be used you know, extremely well. People really connect with each other. And then frankly, we go to dinner together. We, we, it's always been our habit to go offsite and have, have a meal together. And so there's just all this wonderful conversation that happens around the table. Um, and that's just really part of what, what makes it Lamp Camp. So um, we'd love to have you join us. Um, I'll just be blunt and say, please come, send your faculty, send your, uh, your, your folks. Um, we, we'd love to have you come and you'd be very, very welcome. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Matt. I've, you know, questions or comments, I'm welcome to hear those, but I don't need to beat a dead horse. Come. 
<laughs> well, thank you very much, Martin. I think it's a great testament to the quality of this conference that people who have already been are talking about how this is a great event. Other people are fighting over it. And so I see that Ben and Charles are yeah, both fighting too. over who's going to go from ISU. So to <laughs> me, there's no better testament to the quality of a conference than staff members are fighting over who gets to go. So that seems like a pretty good endorsement to me. Well, it's it's a lot of fun, and and we really we really enjoyed. I we we typically get about fifty percent sort of newcomers and fifty percent old guard. In fact, I always at the beginning I I ask for a show of hands. You know, how many of you this is your first conference, and how many have you been here before? And we we keep holding up hands until how many of you have been here for twelve years, and we still have hands up. Um, and it's it's sort of like a reunion for those who have. Uh, met each other before you know they're just glad to see each other again there's so many faces uh that you know we just were like oh yeah i'm so glad to see those people again we only see them once a year but we get to see them so yeah i'll hush and i think that josh's comment earlier that martin mentioned that this conference is really inviting and not intimidating is something that is really really important and something that you don't see in a lot of conferences of any topic or any size where you're just overwhelmed with options and overwhelmed with sessions and information and networking needs. And to find a conference that is not like that and feels you know, more inviting and welcoming than overwhelming is really, really great. And in the meantime, I see that Laura Sierra is now jinxing ISU's upgrade to Sakai 12 by talking about the fact that nothing is going to go wrong. So that's terrible and probably means that we should go ahead and start wrapping things up before Ooh. Laura jinxes any of the rest of us. Let me ask, answer the question that just was posed about uh, the hotel. Uh, there is a block of rooms that's being held uh, for the LAMP conference. They're going to be released fairly soon, though. I, I should have the date in my mind. I, I think it's in May. So um, if you are interested, now's the time. Uh, uh, gra grab the rooms. And it, like I said, it's, it's a little bit of an interesting setup because not, it's not cookie cutter rooms. Um, every room is different. So, you know, you want a room with two double beds and an extra bed and, uh, uh, you know, a view of this, they've got that. Or you want a tiny little room with just one little single bed in it, they've got that. It's just, it's a, it's an eclectic place. And I think it's, it's just the right kind of place for our conference. And Martin, Adam was also asking if you could give just a general estimate of room cost. I know that Boone Tavern yeah, does have a pretty wide range, um, but if you could give just an estimate of that. Yeah, it is a wide range. Thanks for asking that, Adam. It's, it's a good question. And, and it's, um, I think that for most folks, you'll find that they are, it's uh, quite low. Um, I know that there are rooms for probably around 80 bucks and probably the, the fancier rooms go for more like 120. Um, and so for those of you who are used to paying $200 a night for a hotel, you know, that sound, that feels pretty good to us. We, cost of living in Kentucky is fairly low. And so, you know, we kind of go hundred dollars a night. Wow. That's, you know, mm, I don't know, but um, it's, it's sort of in that range there. So let's sort of say 80 to 120 or something along those lines. And as Dave points out, there is Wi-Fi. Yep. There is Wi-Fi. I checked on that. Um, I'm a little concerned that they will, um, that, that, you know, <laughs> I keep saying, it's going to be like 60 or 70 technology people and they're going to all have laptops. Can you handle that? And they say, yes. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who are not familiar with Kentucky or not familiar with Berea, Martin has already talked about this a little bit, but I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, about two hours away. I went to college in Danville, Kentucky, less than an hour from Boone Tavern and Berea. This is a really beautiful area with a tremendous amount of great culture, arts and crafts stuff that you can check out bluegrass music that you can check out. It's very close to Lexington, so it's easy to get in and out. And I highly recommend it. It's a really, really great area, in addition to the great people and the great stuff that you're going to be doing at the conference. And I didn't pay you to say that, did I? <laughs> and there was no compensation for that endorsement. <laughs> that was a completely free endorsement. All right, everybody. Well, I wanted to take just a few minutes and talk about our upcoming meetings. So two weeks from today on Wednesday, May 16th, Corey Nicoletti from Marist College is going to be presenting for us. And I believe that that presentation is going to be about some of their use of their Panopto LTI integration. Corey, is that right? Do you want to say just a couple of things about that? 
Absolutely. You know, it was really great that um, I know you mentioned about video um, and with the with the mingle. Um, so it's it's going to fit right in with some of that. So we do use Panopto and there's some great features there for student engagement. Um, I saw someone in the chat mentioned embedded quiz questions. Um, so we have some great unique cases that I'd like to share both from the faculty perspective. Um, one great recent use case is we actually had a faculty member have students do video blogs instead of written reflections. So, um, so that's pretty much what I'll be sharing. That sounds great. Thanks, Corey. I think that's going to be a really awesome presentation. It's always great to see what other institutions are actually doing in real time in their courses. So I think that's going to be a fabulous presentation. Uh, note that we would normally be meeting on Wednesday, June 6th, but we will not have a meeting on that day because many of us will be in Montreal for Open Aperio. So we will not have a meeting on Wednesday, June the 6th. So our next meeting after Corey's presentation on Wednesday, May 16th will be on Wednesday, June the 20th. And if I can hunt down Josh Wilson and the appropriate people, it might be about rubrics. So be on the lookout for more updates about that. Actually, other... Matt, the next one after that in July, or actually to be two weeks out from there, two meetings out, but the one in July falls on July 4th. Oh, okay. And so we'll, yeah, need, so we'll, to, we'll need to reschedule we'll that at that. some point. Yep, we will need to reschedule that also. So thank you, Wilma, for noting that. And be on the lookout, everyone, for email updates about that, because we may end up uh, moving that or rescheduling that to accommodate the holiday in the United States. Any other final comments or questions before we sign off for today? All right, seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks, everybody, for a great meeting. Thank you so much to Louisa for joining us from the other side of the world today. Thank you so much to Martin and to Wilma uh, for your discussion and your presentation. This was a really great and engaging conversation about a wide range of topics, which is one of the things that I love best about Sakai. So thanks, everybody, for taking the time and for diving into all these topics. And we will look forward to seeing you right here in two weeks to talk a little bit about uh, video blogs and Panopto with Corey. So thanks again, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording. Have a great rest of your day. and We'll see you right here on May 16th.